favorite part, the table has to fall. <laughs> it's great to see you again, and I just want to say it's, it's great to have Greg as part of our church. Um, when we left back in March last year, um, he obviously wasn't here. It's just lovely to have you with us, brother, and your warmth and love for the Lord is um, it's an encouragement to us already. So thank you for uh, leading us so well. And um, just wanted to say as we look at this last chapter in Habakkuk, that a lot of churches um, wouldn't probably even look at Habakkuk. And there's a reason we do this um, as a church. We, we, our bread and butter is to go through books of the Bible and to let God do the talking through whoever's up here. Um, the reason we do that is actually to protect you from the preacher. <laughs> it's kind of a joke, but not really. I'll give you an example. Growing up, I um, went to a church in the States where for about a year, the pastor was speaking about one particular topic. It happened to be money. And that would not have happened if that church was disciplined and letting the Bible do the talking. And so that's why we do what we do. I would have never picked this chapter to preach. In fact, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh dear, <laughs> uh, this is uh, what God has to say to us. But it's good, it's good for the preacher, it's good for us, and it's gonna challenge us, it'll challenge our culture, some of the things we assume. And so with that in mind, let's pay attention to these words that are inspired by the Spirit, and that God wants to speak to us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the first part of this service, and we thank you that our attention's been drawn to you and your sovereign grace to us in Christ. We pray now that we would hear your voice speaking to us through the pages of the Bible, and that you would strengthen our faith in your Son, Jesus. For we ask it in his name. Amen. What kind of song really stirs your soul? Holy, holy, holy did just now. But I'm not talking about the style of music you prefer. Excuse me. There we go. I'm not talking about the style of music you prefer. So I happen to like bluegrass and Bach and even a bit of reggae and basically any music with rhythm in it. But I'm not asking about the style. What are the qualities of any song, no matter the style, that make your heart stir with joy? Why am I raising this? Well, Habakkuk 3 is a song. Uh, Susie, it was, it was well, well read, but it would have been even better if you sang it for us, although we don't know what the tune it was originally. And you can see in verse 1, it is set to a Hebrew tune called a Shigianoth. Verse 19, you can see it's meant to be played with string instruments. So if there's any anti-guitar people here, you don't like guitar in, in worship and in, in singing them, that's your problem, because right here, there's, there's string instruments. And of course, we cannot hear this music live, like they could, the, the, the original audience. But whatever the Shigianon sounds like, and I bet it was pretty cool, uh, this song would have stirred the souls of God's people. And it ought to stir ours. Now, why do I say that? Well, for, for one, the songwriter Habakkuk, or, or Habakkuk, he expresses heartfelt emotion. It's real, it's raw. Uh, the best songs, I'm sure you'd agree, are written by people where it's, uh, who've experienced pain. Think of African American spirituals, which are so beautiful and so moving, and could only have been written by people who suffered serious oppression. They were from the heart, crying out to God. If you look at verse 14, Habakkuk sings about his enemies who came like a whirlwind to scatter me. Imagine a whirlwind coming into your house like a home invasion or something to, to, to uh, hurt him. And the me in verse 14 is probably talking about Habakkuk himself. This is a man who's experienced pain. And you remember how intensely this book began? Habakkuk is wrestling with God throughout the book. Just to quickly refresh our memory, the book begins like this. Habakkuk looks at his countrymen, Judah, and he sees something that looks like South Africa. He sees violence, he sees oppression with the United States. Violence, oppression, he cries out to God, when will you bring justice? 
He's angry. He's complaining to God. And you remember how God answers chapter 1, verse 5. I will do something, Habakkuk. I am raising up the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, to bring judgment against my people Judah. And that perplexes Habakkuk even more. He cries out, how can you, who are holy, use these ruthless, power-worshipping Babylonians, these pagans, to judge us? How can you possibly do that? They're worse than us. And you remember God's answer in chapter 2? He says, look, you have to live by faith. Not by what we see, by faith. What does it look like for Habakkuk? Well, he says, just wait. Live by faith. Just wait. Justice will come in the end. In the end, Babylon will get what it deserves. And that's where we've left off. We started this series on, on, online uh, while we were still in the States, actually. That's where we've left, left off. And that's when Habakkuk, in chapter 3, starts to sing. And like most great songs, most great, great songs express the singing's longer, longing for something that, that transcends this mundane life, for something that has an eternal quality to it. That's why people love love songs. They're, they're, they're longing for something that has this eternal quality. Well, Habakkuk longs here for the eternal God. Chapter 2, he heard about God's justice. Chapter 3, now he sings. And you heard at the end of the song, he sings with joy about God's justice. And we're going to listen to this song under three headings. And hopefully by the end of this, we'll be rejoicing and singing with him. So here's the first part. Verses 1 to 2, a request. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work of judgment. Lord, I do fear probably heard of God's past acts of judgment. Exodus, drowning the Egyptians, for example, in the Red Sea. And Habakkuk basically says to God here, do it again. Revive your work. Bring it. Bring it on. Judge Babylon, he's saying. But then he says, in your wrath, your righteous anger against evil, remember mercy. It's almost like, uh, and if you guys like Nando's, I love Nando's. It's so great to be back. It's almost like asking for an extra hot chicken burger at Nando's, and then you think, oh wait, I'm not sure I can handle what I just asked for. Maybe I should tone it down and make it lemon and herb. herb. See, notice Habakkuk does not say, forget the wrath, just be nice to everyone, God. He asks God to bring it, but then he says, wait a second, I don't know if I can handle that. In the judgment, please be merciful, at least to some of us. And we'll come back to that a bit later. Well, verse 3, the song moves from a request to a revelation, another R word. Or you could say, he sees a vision of God appearing in his glory. Verses 3 to 15, a revelation of God appearing. Now, in order to understand this, we need to realize that like many songwriters, Habakkuk uses metaphors and poetry and lots of imagery. And the imagery is from past events when God judged his enemies. But Habakkuk uses that imagery and he's actually envisioning a future day. He sees the day, he looks forward to the day when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You can see that great verse in chapter 2, verse 14. He's looking to the day of the Lord, the day of judgment and salvation. And notice something new happens in verse 3. For the first time in this letter, it's actually God himself came. God came from Taman, from Mount Paran. If you read Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, what's this talking about? Mount Paran is another word for Mount Sinai, where God himself descended to give the Ten Commandments. And when he descended, in his presence, that mountain shook. And that's what it'll be like when he returns. Habakkuk sees God's splendor covering the heavens and the earth full of his praise. And then in verses 4 to 7, he sees God as a light. It's a light so bright, it has to be veiled, lest it blind us. 
going to make a joke about Eskimo, but I won't go there. <laughs> Habakkuk verse 4, look at the imagery. He sees rays of light flashing. Did you, did you guys have a thunderstorm last night? Woo! This is what he sees, just like last night's lightning bolts flashing. He sees lightning bolts kind of flashing out of a clenched fist. And we all know what a clenched fist means, don't we? You see it on flags, a clenched fist, perhaps holding a hammer or a spear. It symbolizes power to act. Well, God's clenched fist symbolizes his power to act. It's not just that he's glorious and wow, wow, it just blows us away. He's got power to act. In fact, the imagery is pretty neat. He has such unlimited power that he keeps his hand closed as lightning bolts are flying out of it. He keeps his power veiled because if he opened up that hand, he would blow away the universe. You see God's power in action, verse 5? It's a very interesting imagery. You know how a, a president travels in his, with his entourage? And he's got these uh, black cars flashing blue lights in front of his limousine. And then behind him, he's got the same thing. Well, that's, God's got an entourage here, if you will. And a plague precedes him. And pestilence follows him. Picture dead bodies piling up in front of him. Dead bodies piling up behind him. The bodies of his enemies. He's got unlimited power. One look, the nation's shake. Creation quakes. You ever walk into your garden or wherever, and in your presence, birds and grasshoppers kind of run away, flee? Well, look what happens here. At God's presence when he returns, when the Lord Jesus returns, the eternal mountains scatter. We all love the Drakensberg Mountains. We cannot move those mountains one inch if we push with all our might. God flicks them away with a finger. The way we flick away a fly. And in verse 7, Cushon and Midian, some of Israel's old school enemies, they tremble in God's presence. And you know this is meant to be an encouragement to the people of God. Any parent, you parents know this, you hate the thought of your child being bullied at school. If you've been bullied at school, you know how helpless you feel. And I, I remember, I just flipped off a, a little um, bug right there. I remember in sixth grade, I was very skinny. I was skinnier than I am now, believe it or not. And these three large eighth graders surrounded me in a circle. And they were violently pushing me back and forth, and I was being flung around like a a pinball. <laughs> they were so arrogant and mean. I felt so helpless. Can you imagine the jolt of joy I'd feel if suddenly the beast, the rugby player, <laughs> burst onto the scene and came down the hallway and flung these bullies and put them in their place? Well, imagine the relief God's people experienced when in 539 B.C. Cyrus the Great, his army, rolled into town to conquer bully Babylon, which happened. We can read about it in the history books. Or imagine the relief God's people will experience when the Lord Jesus returns in all his glorious might. When those who bully the church, whether in China, the Middle East, the United States, which is happening now, or lesser known bullies, abusive spouses, whoever it is, when all who bully God's people are put in their place by Almighty God, by the everlasting God, by the Lord Jesus, at whose presence creation melts in fear. It's an encouragement. It is. Now notice verses 8 to 15, the psalm changes. Do you see how the pronouns change? The prophet now speaks directly to God. And as was read so well, to us, was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the seas when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? Now, up the hill, we know people ride horses in Hillcrest, 
for fun, but God rides horses for military conquest. That's the picture. Habakkuk sees the Lord as a warrior, and it almost seems like, when he sees it in his vision, it seems like the Lord is raging against the sea, which is quite a picture. Verse 15, look what it says, you trampled the sea with your horses. Unlike Pharaoh's horses, he were trampled by the sea. He tramples the sea. And there's nothing on earth as heavy, as vast, as uncontrollable as, as the roaring sea, especially for the ancient people. The ocean, for them, there's nothing more terrifying. I mean, we go swimming in the, in the sea, right? But God tramples the sea. I like to ask, my son likes to ask, you know, who would win in a battle, a tiger or a lion? Who would win in a battle? The seas or 10,000 lions? The seas. Of course, God's anger is not really against the, the rivers and seas. Notice who it's against. Verse 12, you march through the earth like a general, like a military commander, in fury. You threshed the nations, the nations, the peoples, in anger. Habakkuk sees the Lord conquering his enemies with greater power than King Shaka or Napoleon or Alexander the Great combined. And so if he will war against nations, his enemies, why does it seem like he's warring against the sea? Well, let's try to think about this. Some of you guys serve in the army, and you know that in the army you want the most powerful, cutting-edge technology, right? Of course. So, in an R5 rifle, you take that power over a little 9mm. Of course you would. Well, we all know military technology is key to victory. The United States is one of the few countries with Tomahawk missiles. These are pretty cool, these things. They're very powerful. A Tomahawk missile can hit a target from 1,600 kilometers away. So I did the math, and you launch a missile from Durban Harbor. In two hours, it blows up whatever ship you desire in Simon's Town, Cape Town, within about a five meter radius. That's pretty good, not too shabby. But did you see how powerful the Lord's technology is? The Lord uses rivers and seas and the sun and the moon and lightning as his weaponry. He's not angry at the rivers and seas, it just looks like it because he's using them to wage war against his enemies. That's the picture. You see in verse 9, you split the earth with rivers. Uh, I think back in January, there were the, you probably saw pictures of flooding rivers in Mpumalanga where roads suddenly just vanish. Or after the tsunami, not the one, there was an earthquake in Japan yesterday. I don't know if there's a tsunami, but that, that one several years ago, where the water's just overwhelming everybody. That's the vision here. And then look at verse 10. The mountains saw you and writhed, the raging, raging water swept on. It's as if the, the lofty mountains try to flee in vain from the raging floodwaters. See, when floodwaters rise up to the heavens to cover the mountain peaks, little tomahawk missiles are of no use. They're as weak as a toy Nerf gun. Who needs them? Who needs missiles and atomic bombs when you have the most powerful forces of creation at your disposal? Even look at verse 11. The sun and the moon stood still in their place. That might be alluding to Joshua 10 when the Lord gave Joshua victory over his enemies. It was, it was a military conquest. But even if not, it's this amazing picture. It's as, if, as if the sun and the moon say, Hi, Bob, as arrows from the Lord's bow whiz by. That's the picture. Creation's almost like no way. Now, we may not grasp every detail here. That's not the point. But you get the picture, right? It's scary. It is. Now, God promised Noah, remember back in Genesis, that he will never again overwhelm the earth with a literal flood again. But this will be just as catastrophic, even more, much more. Listen to God's promise in 2 Peter 3, 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. 
And before he returns, the Lord gives us foretastes of judgment. So Revelation 16, I won't read it now, but the Apostle John sees angels pouring out bowls of God's wrath, his anger. And you know what the imagery is? It's seas and rivers turning to blood, and the Euphrates River drying up. It's that sort of imagery. And you know, this vision that Habakkuk has, I was thinking about it, it gives us reason not to be overly concerned about climate change. Now, I'm happy for scientists, I'm sure you are too, we're happy for scientists to measure changes and try to explain why they're happening. And of course, we should be good uh, stewards of God's world. So Ruth and Tempo, if you're listening, we value your work conserving the oceans. We really do. But remember that God is actively governing all things. I really get tired of hearing people sound so alarmist as if uh, if something bad happens like a tsunami, it's, it's, it's on us always. We're responsible for it. Actually, it's God's mountains. It's His rivers. It's His sun. It's His moon. It's His flooding waters. Habakkuk will not let us escape that. And so, yes, be good stewards of the environment. But if and when more so-called natural disasters, they're not natural, they're actually supernatural, if those happen, just remember that God himself is ultimately behind them. And they're actually nothing compared to what's coming. Let's not miss the big point here. This is not a God to trifle with. He will return to judge his enemies, which is good news for his people. It is. I know some of you are probably thinking, I can't wait for this to be over, because how can he expect us to rejoice in a judgment song? You really want me to rejoice in this? Yes. Let me tell you why. Let me ask you. Would you rejoice if South Africa was rid of all violent crime? Of course. And all corruption. Of course you would. How is that going to happen? I'll tell you how it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen through a political party. A political party, whoever it is, cannot free us from evil and deliver perfect justice. No way. Only God can do that. And until God appears, until the Lord Jesus appears, corrupt, violent people will rule the roost. I'm sure your mother told you, life's not fair. It's not. But did you notice what happens? Verse 13. He, this is a great word here. It's, it comes throughout the passage. You went out for the salvation. Underline that word. Salvation of your people. Now, how did you do that? How did you save your people? Well, look at the next part. You crush the head of the house of the wicked. They go together. He won't let us uh, separate salvation and judgment. They go together. They always do. Let me try to illustrate this. You know, there's countless examples, but I think of several years ago, those kidnapped girls in Nigeria. And everyone's saying, hashtag, bring back our girls and all that. These Islamic militants captured them. They had AK-47s with lots of ammunition. How are those girls going to be free? Not hashtags. Only when a greater power takes out the militants, crushes the militants who captured the girls. That's how they're rescued, through judgment on their um, enemies. And I think some of us, many of us here at Western, we kind of struggle with this, actually. Because we like soft justice, which is really no justice at all. So you see, when someone commits a crime, we prefer to send them to counseling than to jail. And we kind of fear using sheer power to enforce justice. Well, God is not soft, and God is not naive. He will deal with evil. See, how can we, who trust the Lord Jesus, be safe from all evil? Well, it's only when God, like a mighty warrior, tramples his enemies in judgment. That's what Habakkuk sees. And it happened. God brought judgment against Babylon in history, but this, of course, is a vision of greater judgment, a final justice. A day is coming when God will conquer all his enemies and creation will shake. Are we ready for that day? You don't want to be, I don't want to be God's enemy on that day. You don't. And the, the, the crazy thing is that left to ourselves, we are, all of us. But God offers his enemies mercy. Did you hear the lyrics of the songs we sang? He offers us mercy. 
In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, not take away the wrath. In wrath, remember mercy. See, God, before this day, came to earth in person. God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to the earth. And as we sang, on the cross when he died, he bore the righteous wrath of God, that we who were his enemies, all of us are his enemies by nature, that we deserve. That's what happened. Thank you, Jesus, as we say. See, the cross shows us that our salvation only comes through judgment, through our Savior Jesus being judged in our place. Friends, God is rich in mercy. He doesn't want anyone to perish to Peter. And because Jesus died for his enemies and rose from the, get, from the dead, he offers us forgiveness. Everyone here, he's holding out his hand to you. If we repent, if we turn to him, if we trust him to rule us and forgive us, we'll be safe from the coming wrath that we deserve. And we are saved, not by works, but by faith in him. Some people say, well, that's all the New Testament. Well, it's right here in the Old Testament. Habakkuk said in chapter 2, the righteous shall live by faith. You want to be right with God? It's by faith, trusting what He has done for us in Christ. By trusting Jesus. Now just make no mistake though. Every person who is puffed up, who is proud, who does not repent and believe in the Lord Jesus, remains God's enemy. And this is coming. And you know, we may not do as much obvious evil as Babylon. We all look very nice this morning. We look very good. We may not do as much obvious evil as Babylon. But if we're self-sufficient, if we're arrogant, trusting in our own puny power, the Lord will put us in our place. He will. Okay. Last thing, this will be shorter. That section was the longest. The last part of this song. How should we respond to this? Well, thirdly and finally... Just notice how Habakkuk responds. First, in verse 16a, he trembles. He fears the Lord. Look what he says. I hear this, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones, and my legs tremble beneath me. His knees are knocking, literally. And you might think, some of us, isn't uh, fearing God an Old Testament thing? This is the New the New Testament. Well, no. Because think of what happens in Revelation chapter 1, where the Apostle John sees the risen, reigning Lord Jesus, and he says, I fell at his feet as though dead. Same reaction. The question for us is, do we fear the Lord? If not, it's because we've replaced Habakkuk's vision of a big God, the God who flicks away mountains with his finger, with a little God of our own imagination. How do we change that? Let this vision be our vision, and we will fear. Secondly, verse 16b, the second half of verse 16, Habakkuk waits. So he says, now I must uh, quietly wait for the day of distress to come upon the people invading us, Babylon. Now, waiting for justice, for God to bring justice, it takes faith. It takes trust in him. Think about this. A little while ago, Brendan Horner, a 21-year-old farm manager, was brutally murdered, right? You know this. What happened? Some free state farmers tried to storm the court and take justice into their own hands. They overthrew a police vehicle. They did not wait for the court case. Now, why didn't they wait for justice? Not sure what was said, it was probably right, because they don't trust the justice system. See, if we trust that in the end God will bring justice to all unrepentant evildoers who hurt us, we'll be able to wait for God to act. You see how trusting and waiting go together? Now, of course, it's easier said than done, isn't it? But that's the life of faith, of patient waiting. And of course, as we wait, we don't just sit and do nothing. We hold out God's mercy in Christ to a world who, just like us, we're no different, just like us, deserves His wrath. Thirdly, finally, under this point, Habakkuk 
rejoices. This is probably the most famous uh, verses in Habakkuk, verses 17 and 19. Picture this, though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no fruit on the vines, and though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, and though the flocks disappear from the pen, and there are no birds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. You notice Habakkuk rejoices despite his circumstances. Maybe you can relate to some of those circumstances. Though it's been a tough year, though the comforts are bare, though I don't currently have a job, though there's been no church gatherings, no in-person classes, limited electricity, maybe even though I'm suffering serious injustice or I'm sick, maybe your work is deemed unessential by people in authority. Though those things are our circumstances, by faith we can rejoice in God our Savior. And you might be sitting here thinking, yeah, well, that's Habakkuk, a great believer, not me. That'll never be me. I can't really do that, actually. Well, do you remember how, how this book started? It started out with Habakkuk perplexed and confused and crying out to God. And now this same Habakkuk ends the book rejoicing. How does that happen? Have his circumstances changed? No, not at all. In fact, he hears it's going to get worse before it gets better. But what did change is that the Lord changed him. And he can change you and me, dear friend. You know, there's lots of how-to books. You go to bookshops about growing as a Christian. Forget those. What really transformed Habakkuk? It's so simple. He just got to know God better. Think about it. He had a vision of God's power. He had a promise from God that he's going to bring justice. And he trusted God. He took him at his word. It is that simple. And it's the same for us. It's by knowing God that we change and trusting him. Well, let me conclude. Well done for persevering a second week with the masks on. I don't envy you. But let me conclude. This is a great song. It is. And it is possible for us to join in singing it today. To leave here like Habakkuk. Notice uh, verse 19. He's bounding like a, a spring bog with a fresh bounce in our step. And we can even do that amidst the violence and injustice. We can sing for joy if we're living by faith. If we're trusting the God of our salvation who will bring justice. Fear Him. Wait for Him, and yes, rejoice in Him. Sing of God's justice. Sing of God's salvation. And we're going to do that just now as the muses think, join us. But let's pray before that. I hope they're coming. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we live in an age where it's very unpopular to even talk about fearing you. And so I pray that you would put the fear of you in our hearts, that we would cling to Jesus as our only refuge, that we would proclaim him to a world that is going to face your wrath, and that we would in fact look forward to this day and rejoice in you, the God of our salvation and the God who will bring perfect justice in the end. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.